This is Dr. Daniel Darko in his teaching on the Gospel of Luke. This is session number 11, Itinerant Ministry, Jesus, Women, and the Parable of the Sower. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. Welcome back to the Biblical e-learning lecture series on the Gospel of Luke. In the previous lecture, we looked at Jesus and the sinful woman. In that account, we emphasize the fact that Jesus has come for all people, and Jesus engages all people. He was at a scene with the Pharisees, and precisely, Simon, the Pharisee, had invited him to his home. And it was in that scene that a woman who was known to be a sinful woman came into contact with Jesus, showed some gestures that would otherwise be problematic, but Jesus used the occasion to, know, to show the Pharisees that indeed he has come not only for the righteous, but for even the one they deem to be a sinner. He pronounced forgiveness and peace to this woman. Going to chapter 8, still while Jesus was in Galilee, we are going to see the ministry of Jesus expanding. Here, he would move to some other areas in the region in Galilee. We will be informed about those who follow him and the immediate teaching discourse that Luke will record for us will be in parables. Let me just call the next few verses from 1 to 21 of chapter 8. Jesus is teaching in parables. As we go through this session, I will draw our attention to the fact that the discourse begins with a short summary of the travel narrative followed by Jesus telling a parable known as the parable of the sower. He follows quickly after telling the parable to explain the reasons for which he speaks in parables. Unlike any other parable that we know about of Jesus in the Gospels, this one he will give elaborate meaning of the parable of the sower, and we will look at that in detail. As if this parable does not convey the central issues he likes to convey, Jesus will go on to give a parable on the lamp of the lamp. And then it is in that scene that the brothers, the siblings of Jesus will show up and he will be informed that his siblings want to see him. And here Jesus will go on to establish that his true kinship are those who listen to his teachings and obey them. Pause a moment before we get into the parables. Let's read chapter 8 from verse 1 to 3. Pay attention to some details about what Luke is trying to convey to us before he goes on to tell us the parable. And I read, from the ESV. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Harold's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. As you take note of this passage, let's make some quick observations before I move on. Jesus moving from the scene with the party with the Pharisees will go on from cities and villages and speak, proclaim, bring along the good news of the kingdom of God. 
bringing and proclaiming the kingdom of God is powerful. The kingdom of God in the ministry of Jesus is not a geographical kingdom. It's the reign of God. It's the power of God in manifestation. It's God's reign over the lives, hearts, and minds of people. It's God exercising his power over three dominant enemies to what he has come to do in our world. The enemies of the kingdom of God are not people. They are sin, death, and Satan. God comes to reign and demonstrate his power over all this. Jesus goes from cities and villages proclaiming, bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is powerful and manifested. Jesus proclaimed the good news which brings healing to those who hear, who brings restoration, forgiveness, peace to those who hear him. He brings the kingdom of God when he demonstrates his power and set free those who are sick, who are demon-possessed, who come to encounter God and receive wholeness. Jesus traveling through the cities and the villages did not go alone, Luke tells us. He was accompanied by the twelve whom Luke had told us are at this time called apostles. With the twelve, there were also some women who were in the team. Here, I would like us to pay close attention to the role of the woman in the team pertaining to two things Luke is trying to do here. He just talked about a sinful woman in the context of the Pharisees. And here, proclaiming the good news, he's going to mention also women, showing his interest in the role of women in ministry. But then, Luke also mentions bringing the power, the kingdom of God from cities and villages. And Luke will show us that these are women who have benefited from the ministry of the kingdom of God. Who are following the ministry of Jesus because they have been recipients and beneficiaries of what this ministry brings. Let's look at this woman in the ministry of Jesus. Three in particular are named. When we think about the profile of this woman, Luke tells us that they are first a woman called Mary from the town of Magdala. The woman often referred to as Mary Magdalene, namely Mary of Magdala. And then there's another woman called Joanna. And then another Susanna. Luke is quick to mention these three names. And then he said many others, indicating that these three are very prominent women. Luke reminds us about what is it that they have benefited from the ministry of Jesus. He says, they have received healing from evil spirits. Yes, they have received healing from evil spirits. Having great status, having monetary power, having right economic standing in Luke's gospel does not immune one from being influenced by evil spirits or does not immune one of their need for encounter with Jesus Christ. He talks about Mary of Magdala in particular. And he says, this is a woman of whom seven demons had been cast out. Whenever I read this, I pause to think about what will happen in our churches today if a prominent woman was known to have seven demons and the demons came out of that person by the grace of God. 
Imagine the stigma in our churches today that the person will carry. Imagine perception and relational issues that person may be having. Imagine how much people will project her past into her present to even determine her future course of action. But you see, Luke wants to tell you that Jesus healed her of these seven evil spirits. And that will not be the end because we will hear and read of Mary Magdalene in the Gospels. Luke will tell us more about her later. John has a lot to say about her. This is a woman who will be the first person to testify of the risen Lord. If you like, the message Christ is risen, he's risen indeed, was first given to a woman to deliver to the men who were out of the scene. And Mary of Magdala was that woman. Here, that is not a role she's playing. She and other women were here to support the ministry of Jesus. So Luke wants to tell us that this important woman was demon-possessed. But look at the second woman he mentions, Joanna. And he wants us to know that Joanna is the wife of Shusa. Joanna's husband was the administrator of Herod, perhaps Herod Antipas in Galilee. This is a prominent woman. And then we have we have uh, Susanna and many others. So imagine that Joanna, the wife of Shusa, this prominent woman is in the system. Whether we look at her, some have suggested perhaps she is the wife uh, she's the manager of the husband, is the manager of Herod the Tetrarch. Whoever this character will be, Luke wants you to know that there were prominent women who followed Jesus and they did something. Their ministry was very, very specific. They served Jesus and the twelve. And they did that by providing for their needs. I like the Greek word which explains that they actually served. It's, a more, it's more of a word of saying they served with their, with, 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 their, with their substance. This woman, later on, we will be told in chapter 23, they will be there to witness the execution of Jesus. And two of them will be the witnesses of the barrier. In chapter 23, and Mary and Joanna will be among the first to witness the resurrection. We find interesting patterns here that pertains to custom. We find that not only did Jesus have women following him in his ministry, Luke wants to tell us that married women followed Jesus. I find it quite interesting that married women will follow Jesus. But when we look at rabbinic literature, it is not uncommon that women supplied the needs of rabbis. So it is not really difficult to conceive that women who had perceived the ministry of Jesus as a great teacher will find in him someone they should support in this regard. They provided for his needs. Having said that, Luke will move quickly that Jesus who proclaimed and brought the kingdom of God will begin to talk in parables. So far in these lectures, I have not said much about parables. 
So before we go on to read the parable of the sower in Luke, I'll give you a general overview of what is going on with the parables of Jesus in Luke in particular. That way, when I come to other parables, I will not spend a lot of time to give you introduction to parables. So what is a parable in the first place? In the broader sense, a parable is an analogy, it's a comparison. Think about para. Something going side by side. Sometimes in parables, Jesus employed contrast to be able to convince and persuade the audience as he tells a story. Jesus used parables very often to disclose various aspects of the kingdom of God and to prompt adequate response in relation to how God will be treated and related to. Parables are not true stories. But they are analogies. Jesus speaks sometimes from real circumstances, reconstruct scenarios to make comparative thought, to stimulate the thought pattern and to make his point quite clear to his audience. When Jesus speaks in parables, he's picking up things that are familiar and drawing analogies and bringing them to bear in his teaching so that the people will use images that are familiar in their subconscious mind to imagine the concept, the content, the substance of the kingdom of God that Jesus conveys. There are four types of parables that Jesus presents in the Gospels. Luke will show them, and Luke will give us some of the most memorable and interesting parables of all the Gospels. The four types of parables that Jesus will use in his teachings, according to David Ewan, are as follows. The parables that are presented in the form of allegory. The parables that are presented in the form of similitude. Parables proper, which are usually analogies. And exemplary stories, like what we will see later on with the Good Samaritan. Jesus uses these four types of parables to make the message of the kingdom of God clear, but also vivid in the imagination of his audience. I like C.H. Dodd's definition of parables. When he writes that, When we think about parables and their definition, we should think about the natural expression of a mind that sees truth in concrete pictures rather than receives it in abstractions. In other words, instead of following concepts in Jesus' teaching, Jesus gives you images attached to the concepts so that you can Imagine the concept in concrete pictures. Jesus was a great teacher. A few years ago, I had a student who had transferred from one of our sister schools in the greater Boston area. The student was a philosophy student in that school and came here as a philosophy student who would minor in biblical studies. In a class, as I taught, the student reminded me about his former professor in that school in the greater Boston area. His philosophy professor decided to teach a course on the parables of Jesus. The only thing at issue was that the philosophy professor was an atheist. The student tells me about a whole class devoted to 
The teacher explaining that Jesus was a master teacher. If all teachers could capture the ability of Jesus to convey concepts in parables, the world will be a better place. The atheist professor was persuading his student, including this particular student I had at Gordon College, that if you don't like anything about Jesus, you should love his parables. I agree. And so did I tell the student. Jesus was a master teacher. So anytime we come to the parables of Jesus, please pay close attention and understand the powerful messages that are conveyed through parables and the literary artistry that Luke demonstrates in how he conveys this message in writing to us. But before we look at the first in chapter 8, I want to give you a list of parables because you are aware of so many that are not found anywhere in other Gospels except Luke. So that as we go through Luke's parables, you begin to appreciate that Luke is the Gospel you want to love and love indeed. And his parables are the most memorable and the ones that you like the most. So a quick list on the list of parables that are unique to Luke. And then we'll begin to look at one of the parables Luke writes about. Luke is the only one who writes about a parable of the two debtors that I spoke about in the previous lecture. Luke was the only one who tells us about the parable of the Good Samaritan which we are yet to cover in this series. Luke is the only one who tells us about the unfortunate friend who shows up and asks for help. He's the only one who tells us that parable. The rich fool, Christian fundraisers like this parable. Luke is the only one who tells us about this parable. Luke is the only one who tells about the parable of the barren fig tree. Places at the banquet. Luke is the only one who gives us that parable. Yes, Luke has more. He's the only one who gives us the parable about the tower builder and the king going to battle in chapter 14. He's the only one who tells us about the parable of the lost coin or drachma. The parable of the lost son, one of my favorites. Luke is the only one who tells us that. Luke is the only one who tells us this controversial parable, the parable of the unjust steward. When we reach there, I will tell you why it is controversial. He's the only one who tells us about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The parable of the steward's reward, Stephen's reward, is only Luke who tells us that. The parable of the unjust judge and the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Note, I said publican, not republican. If you look at these parables that Luke presents, that other gospels do not write about, for most people, they are the only parables you remember. As we go through Luke's parables, I'd like you to pay attention to it because they are not just stories, as I tried to explain earlier on. It is Jesus conveying deep concepts and concrete pictures. What I will try to do here is to make the images clear, to make the content come through clearer and brighter to you. I don't claim to be as good of a teacher as Jesus. Perhaps you know someone who is, but I'm not. But I'll try as much as possible to make the message of Jesus come through these parables. 
So let's begin to read from verse 4 to 8 of Luke chapter 8. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, he said in parable, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock. And as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, they are in parables. So that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and take away the word from their hearts that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while. And in time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart. And bear fruit with patience. In this parable known as the parable of the sower. Jesus draws our attention to the ground in which the seed falls. And the ground is the focal point as he uses the ground as an imagery to illustrate reception of the message of the kingdom of God. If the ground is good, the seed lands and the seed will grow. The condition of the ground on which the seed falls determines the viability of the seed to grow, to bear fruit. Reception and a heart which receives the message of the kingdom is big in this parable. You note here the ground, the disposition. Jesus talks about pressures and pleasures of life and commitment. And then later he will talk about what is honest and good heart that receives the fruit. And then he qualifies it by saying, it receives the fruit and uh, it receives the fruit and bears fruit with patience. When Jesus gives the reason to the parable, he's telling the, the disciples that they are special. 
Because they are being given insight to these matters. But they should not miss it. As much as the ground is important, they should also know what the seed is. The seed is the word. The seed is the message. And you should know that in Luke, the word is very important. The message of Jesus is sometimes described as the word. If you go to Acts in particular in the second volume of Luke, what spreads to the world is the word. The seed is the word. I try to make it graphic to try to explain what Jesus is doing here and highlight a few things in this parable. First, he said, one seed fell along the path. That seed was trampled underfoot. Birds of the air devoured it. But please pay close attention to how he explained it. Those people heard. But the birds that came is the devil. Here I like to remind you if you are not comfortable with demonology. Luke would like you to understand his worldview. In Luke's worldview, demons possess people and people are healed from evil spirits like Mary of Magdala. In Luke's world, the devil is an enemy who works against the kingdom of God and is doing everything to undermine God's course of action. In this parable, when Jesus brings the parable out, the first thing he wants to, the readers to understand is the role of the devil in reception. Yes, you may be saying, I can hear from your accent, you must be African. And you like to talk about demons. One, I'm an African, so you'll be correct. Two, I like to talk about demons. Uh, yeah, because Luke talks about demons. So Luke must be African too. But for a minute, let's go on to explain more what Luke is doing here. For Luke, the devil tempted Jesus to rob him of what God wants to do in the world. The devil possesses people to destroy them against the very being and essence of who God has made them to be, and Jesus sets them free. The devil goes about trying to undermine so many people's welfare and well-being, and God intervenes in the power of the kingdom of God and sets them free. But here too, in this parable, Jesus says, the devil in a very crafty way tried to hinder people from receiving the word of God. It is a difficult thought when you live in the Western Hemisphere where the devil and every concept of the devil is greeted with skepticism. And one questions, what is this weird thing about the devil? Well, I am not here to convince you otherwise. I think all that I'm trying to do here is Let us not gloss over what Luke is trying to convey in this message. When the word is sown, the devil comes and he takes away the word. Look at where he takes away the word from. He takes away from the hearts of these people so that they may not believe and be saved. Later on, we will see when Jesus dispatched the disciples to go into missions, he will give them the power over the devil and his forces. Because in Luke, these are central obstacles to what God is doing. In Luke's spirit cosmology, evil spirits are active in the lives of people 
and are able to rob people of what God has for them. But God, the powerful God, when he comes in his reign in the kingdom of God, he can overpower the forces of darkness and set free those who are held bound and distracted by the forces of darkness. Luke said some will receive the word, but the condition of their hearts will not be right, so the devil will take that away. But he says, for the one which falls on the rock, in the analogy, he says, it grew up and withered away because he had no moisture. How did he explain the lack of moisture? He said, those people, they hear the word, they receive it with joy. But they have no root. They believe for a while. And in time of testing, in time of storms, they fall away. Jesus is still teaching on the reception of the word. And he's saying there are those who are quick to go, oh, I have heard Jesus, I know Jesus. If you are like me, I have seen a few of those people at church. They have all the Jesus songs. They have all the Christianese. If you are preaching, they say three hallelujah before you finish one sentence. And as soon as difficult situations hit them, they denounce Jesus. They say, I don't want to be a Christian again. Luke said, it is true, it is real, that as the word is spread, there are those whose heart will receive it. And because of the condition of the heart, this is what happens. Third is, he said, the seed falls among thorns. When it grows up, it grows up with the thorns. But the thing is that the thorns choke it. And when Jesus explains it, he said, They are the ones who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked. Why are they choked by? They are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. So their fruit does not mature. When I look at this parable, and I think about my short years of ministry, it is so true to think about the condition of the heart and how the word falls in these storms and the cares and the riches choke people. I have known too many people who become good Christians Love God when they have no crisis. As soon as they see, they they get themselves into big trouble, they need Jesus the most. I've seen people, when they were broke, they were so committed in their walk with God. When they get some money or become well off financially, They are too busy to go to church or to think about Jesus. They think they are in control. But in the words of Jesus, they are choked. They are choked by the circumstances around them. They are choked by their pleasures. They are choked by their pressures around them. So those two keywords, the pleasures and the pressures around them, are driving them away from where they're supposed to be to bear fruit and mature. But you see, the seed that falls into the good soil is a simple verb, grew. And that seed yielded the only one that is qualified numerically hundredfold. 
And Jesus said in explanation, this is those hearing the word, they hold it fast. In an honest and good heart. And consequently, they bear fruit with patience. The parable of the seed describes Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God and prepares the disciples, the women, and all those following Jesus that as they go out in ministry, they should expect this reception. So it's okay when you see some of these things bearing out. In fact, Jesus in, in, in Luke chapter 8 wanted those around him to be aware that this is what comes with ministry. Some will receive it with that genuine, honest, good heart. Some, their heart is not in the right place. Some, the devil is at work trying to rob them. Should that discourage? No. Will that be setbacks if you don't see the fruit? Yes. The point of Jesus to the disciples here and Luke's portrait of it is Jesus is not going about ministry thinking that it's always going to be so successful. But in fact, he teaches the crowd in the hearing of the disciples and the women that he's fully aware there are these four possibilities of reception to the message he proclaimed. And then he goes on verse 16 and tells this parable. That is self-explanatory. He goes on to say, No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest. Nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care then, note verse 18, take care then how you hear. Again, reception. For to the one who has more will be given uh, from the one who has not even what he thinks he has will be taken away. The point of Jesus is this. Some may say, I have a good heart and I have received the word. Some may say, I am not like the one that fell on the roadside or the one that fell on the rock or the one that fell in the thorns. But Jesus said, you know what? We will know. The second parable explains that we will know. Don't even try to argue with anyone because you can't hide a light on a bush. It will show out. Let it be so clear as he put it in verse 18. Let no one be under illusion but they should take care about how they hear the word of God. As he said earlier on, those who have years to hear, let him hear. Because if they don't, notice how he phrases verse 18. Those who hear, the one who has more, more will be given. And then he goes on to play with this irony there. But from the one who has not, even what he thinks is not what he has. What he thinks he has, what he wants to speculate that he has, 
will be, given, will be taken away from him. At this point, in the midst of the crowd, while he has delivered this powerful speech, his mother shows up. Jesus' mother showed up, shows up, Mary shows up with his brothers. And they came to him. But they could not reach him, Luke tells us, because of the crowd. As he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, desiring to see you. But Jesus answered them, My mother and my brother are those who hear the word of God and do it. Please understand what Luke is conveying here. Because too many people have explained this particular passage or couple of verses as if Jesus did not like the natural family or as if Jesus came to replace natural family with kinship concept or kinship household of God. No. The point is still the same as he began in verse 4. When Jesus gave the parable, he gave the parable to emphasize those who hear the word and receive the word. The whole parable of the sower explains that. The parable of the lamb shows to say, if you think you are hearing, but you are not hearing and receiving, that is problematic. Luke here nails it down in verse 21 to say, wait a minute, Jesus is ready to say, you should prioritize hearing the word of God and doing it above all other things. He is not saying to the exclusion of natural family members. No, verse 21 is the key point here. People should prioritize hearing the word of God and doing it above some of the most important responsibilities in Jewish culture as maintaining your kinship obligations. Jesus did not come to destroy natural family relations. Jesus prioritizes the kingdom of God, though, above all relations. If you understand that, you are catching the heart of Jesus. If you tell yourself that for some reason, because of this verse, you can neglect your family and then go on and do God's work somewhere, wait a minute. That is not the point here. The mother of Jesus was referred to as the mother of Jesus. The brothers were referred to as the brothers of Jesus. They were still his kinsmen. But here he's emphasizing priority. Hearing and doing. Again, This is one of those areas that people have used to refer to the Catholic-Protestant debate. Does the reference to the brothers mean Mary had children? I explain in the infancy narrative that, yes, in this reference in chapter 8, Luke seemed to suggest to us that Jesus has brothers. But various church traditions have tried to explain what the word brother will mean. Traditional Catholic view would be that it refers to first cousins. The Eastern Orthodox view will mean that it will refer to his half-brothers. In other words, Joseph had children before Mary and this will be his half-brothers. Traditional Protestant view would be biological brothers. 
as the Greek text stands, the word adelphos is not used for cousins per se. On rare occasions, yes. But in contexts like this, when it is related to the biological or the maternal figure in the household, it often refers to a brother. But what kind of brother? We are in the field of conjecture. I respect the traditions and various what various traditions will say. But I lean more towards the traditional Protestant view that the mother and the brothers coming to meet Jesus in chapter 8 of Luke seem to suggest to me that Mary had children. After all, Joseph is no longer in the scene. So we will not be knowing a lot about Joseph's children. And the, the notion, that the second question one should ask is, if Joseph had left children that are older than Jesus, will they be Mary's responsibility if Joseph is deceased? That is another cultural thing to examine if you are exploring the issue of kinship in the first century context of Palestine. But here, I would not like you to miss the trust of the issue here. Luke begins chapter 8 by giving you a short summary of the travel narrative, telling you that Jesus went about cities and villages proclaiming the kingdom of God. And then he tells us about the woman who accompanied him to provide for their needs. There he was quick to highlight three of these women who are prominent figures. And then he goes on to start telling us about part of the messages of the kingdom Jesus delivered in parables. There he gave us the parable of the sower. Emphasizing the need to receive the word of God and how the condition of the heart determines the viability and growth and maturity of the one who hears. The parable of the Lamb emphasizes that let no one be under illusion. If any one of us claim we are hearing, but it's not reflecting in our doing, we may be deceiving ourselves. He calls to action the need to prioritize hearing the word of God and doing it. Even in circumstances where temporarily people of one's family needs one's attention, one should prioritize hearing the word of God and doing it. Precisely Hearing the word of God as it pertains to the kingdom of God and doing it. I hope that as you follow this series, you are beginning to understand the heart of the ministry of Jesus. And especially as you follow the parable of the sower, that you are examining yourself as to the condition of your heart. Is it the kind of heart that is likened to that of a rock in the thorns by the wayside? Or one that will be likened to the good soil? My hope is that wherever you are, you make the transition to allow your heart to be prepared to be the good soil on which the word of God could be planted and grow and mature and bear fruit like light that is put on the lampstand so that others will see. In Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, 
Matthew talking about this. Said in Matthew 5.16. So let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good deeds. And glorify your father. Who is in heaven. Thank you for following us. In this lecture series. I hope that God is blessing you. Open your eyes to new things in the gospel of Luke. And also bringing you into a deeper relationship with him. Thank you again. And I hope you continue this journey of learning with us. God bless you. This is Dr. Daniel Darko in his teaching on the Gospel of Luke. This is session number 11, Itinerant Ministry, Jesus, Women, and the Parable of the Sower. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 21.